Hello, welcome to uh, Stanford Sustainable Finance and Investment uh, Seminar. Um, the seminar is hosted by uh, Stanford Precourt Institute for Energies Sustainable Finance Initiative, which is SFI. Um, and then we explore uh, multiple disciplines of sustainable finance uh, with talks by uh, researchers associated with SFI and also across the campus and our uh, visiting speakers. So we meet uh, every month uh, during the winter and spring quarter. And this seminar turns into a, a weekly based uh, uh, academic uni granting course during the fall. So uh, stay tuned for uh, uh, coming up event as well. Um, and then as you know, the, the seminar is open to Semper staff, faculty and students. Um, and then when speaker consent, like today, uh, the, the seminar is open to the public. So welcome everyone. Um, today we have Dr. Yong Jun Baek, um, who, who is a researcher at uh, Stanford Center in Songdo, Korea. Uh, Dr. Baek uh, did his PhD in energy, environment, and policy from Korea University. And he, uh, he was also a researcher at um, Asian Development Bank Institute and also Tokyo uh, Institute for Technology. Um, and this is uh, our big welcoming of Dr. Yong Jun Baek to the new center uh, that Stanford just opened up in Korea. Um, uh, let me just give you a little bit more about what the center is doing. So we just opened up uh, last June. Um, this is the very first uh, global research center of Stanford University um, opened up a road. Uh, and then uh, the this, this center uh, research is uh, uh, rounded across um, um, based on the smart city research. But you know, like uh, we are looking at the smart city from like a more broader perspective, not only you know like some technology and science, but also uh, in the consideration of social science. Uh, and then we are looking at the sustainable um, smart city research from um, mobility, design thinking, and sustainability and entrepreneurship angle. So uh, if you are interested in exploring more about the center, uh, go to korea.stanford.edu. Uh, and Dr. Yung Jun Baek uh, is coming from the center, uh, joining the center um, this year. So, uh, you know, we are uh, having uh, this, this seminar to learn more about uh, Dr. Yung Jun Baek's research. Um, and it's great to have you, Yung Jun. Um, Please take the stage. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you for the great introduction. As uh, So Young mentioned, I'm uh, Young Jun Baek, and I'm currently working at the Stanford Center at the Incheon Global Campus. And today, I would like to share some of my, uh, my research and also not only give a talk on it, but also I'll, I'm looking forward to some discussions and maybe some feedback on my research so I can always improve on uh, where I'm going. So today I'm going to be talking about low carbon scenarios and policies for the power sector in Botswana. And uh, a lot of you might not even know where Botswana is. It's a, it's a, a country in Africa. It's on top of South Africa. If you look at the map, right on top of South Africa, there's Botswana. Then you might have a question of why is he, why is an Asian guy studying something about uh, Africa? And if I may give you the answer is that uh, I actually had an opportunity to live there for like 10 years. Uh, so like throughout my teenage life, I was in Botswana and my family actually, they're still uh, in Botswana and my, my friends are all there. So it's a very close place to me and it's like a second home change of title. What I meant by that is that even though I'm talking about low carbon scenarios and policies for the power sector in Botswana, I could actually change that, like change that country into maybe something bigger, maybe sub-Saharan Africa, or I could even broaden it much more into maybe mid or low income developing countries. 
So I was thinking uh, thinking a lot about the title. What should I say? Should I say Botswana or should I say Sub-Saharan Africa or even should I just be ambitious and say developing countries? The reason I did that is because uh, I haven't looked through every developing countries, but they seem to share like common characteristics. For example, like especially in the power sector, they like they have a very low electrification rate, maybe 50, maybe 60 at the most. And even those that have electricity, they do not like enjoy the full capacity. It, it like there's a power, power outage like frequently. Sometimes when I was living in Botswana, they, they might uh, turn it off for two, three hours because there was lack of uh, supply. And also not only in the urban area, but in the rural area, they have absolutely no electricity. So they are like off grid. And in that case, what they do is they usually uh, rely on like kerosene or diesel generator. So I was thinking, even though, uh, even though I'm talking about Botswana, which is my, the uh, title of my article, maybe I could have expanded it more into uh, Sub-Saharan Sub Africa or even developing countries. So please uh, bear that in mind. Now, food for thought. Uh, this is the big theme that sort of like go through the go through the talk today. Like this is what I want to be talking about. What is the future of Africa? Like where are they going? What should they be doing? And I was thinking maybe there could be three possibilities. And the first one could be traditional development. I am I'm sure a lot of you have seen, already seen this uh, graph before. It's called the uh, environmental Kuznets curve. You, uh, what it means is that as the, the per capita income, so as the economy develops, the environmental degradation will rise, then eventually go down. So most of the, most of the developing countries will be on this side. And once like you pass this uh, threshold, then you start to think about the environment. Like most, like if you look at de uh, develop, developed countries, they they care about the environment. They think about what they're doing. They try to mitigate uh, GHT emissions, so on. So, what I mean by traditional development here is that uh, if the African countries are left as left as as they are, like for example, uh, business as usual then they will eventually follow the same path that the developed countries have already followed. So they'll have to destroy the environment. The environment has to get worse before they are able to pass this threshold and start worrying about the environment and start thinking about in improving the environment. Then the second scenario or a pathway, I would say, would, could be income inequality, which means that African countries just remain as it is, but, and they try to follow the traditional development path. But as you, as we all know, the, the whole, the, the, the international community is working hard to combat the climate change. They're trying to reduce CO2 uh, emissions and like EU is trying to put up the EU um, carbon um, uh, border tax. So it's getting much harder and harder for these African countries to enjoy the traditional development path. Because not only, if they can do it locally, that's no problem, but this is a global world and you have to trade with the outside world. You have to trade with developed countries. But these countries are pull, pulling up their um, trade barriers through various means, as I just mentioned. And eventually they, if that happens, then the developed countries will continue to advance and continue to use all these advanced technologies they have developed, but African countries cannot enjoy these, uh, the fruits of these uh, new technologies, for example. Then in that case, what happens is that we're gonna have this inequality, the gap of, uh, the gap between the developed countries and developing countries will just keep widening. So that could be a second path and what could be the third path that we could uh, follow? I would say that could be uh, inclusive transition, meaning that as climate change uh, is a, it's a global issue, it's an, something that the international community has to come together and to work together, 
So rather than just ignoring the African countries or as you've seen during the, um, the Paris Agreement, they had came up with this um, term called, um, term or uh, I don't know, a concept called common but differentiated responsibility, meaning that developed countries will do their responsibility while the developing countries will do the, uh, do the other responsibility. But by separating the uh, responsibility, what I think is that they're trying to, that's just a way of going to the second path saying that developed countries, they, they will do um, as much as they can do while leaving out the rest, then it's just going to go to the second path, even though they are trying to say that we're trying to include everyone, trying to go through an inclusive transition. So I don't know which path we'll be taking, but I'm sure everyone would agree that we have to take the third path of inclusive transition, but it's no easy task. I mean, we all talk about inclusive tra uh, transition or just transition, but it's not as easy as it is. So I want, like, this is a, uh, some, a big theme that I'd like all of us to think about while we have this uh, seminar. Now, if you look at the global emission, um, as you can see, I, uh, this is just, this is the, like I've divided into regions, but the black part, the black uh, line is the Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I'm not sure if you know, but like in Africa, we usually divide it into Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East and Northern Africa because the Middle East or MENA, they call it, the MENA region has like high income. So they usually try, uh, try to divide it into the, the Northern Africans, uh, Northern Africa region and Sub-Saharan African regions. So when you look at the Sub-Saharan African region, the global emission hasn't really grown or comparatively, compared to other regions, the global emission hasn't really increased over time. So people might think, uh, okay, they have really, they are not really emitting much. Like they have a very small, share. If you look at here, uh, if you look into percentage, in 2018, they had less than 3% contribution to the global uh, CO2 emission. So people might argue that, okay, they're, they're like below the, the top priority. I mean, we have much higher emitters, people emitting, I mean, countries emitting much higher like China or US. Why not focus on them? Why, why focus on some uh, countries that are not, not even really emitting much at the moment? But that could be an argument, but I would say uh, that's just looking at right now. Like you have to think about what's gonna happen in the future. I, as I mentioned in the, in the uh, second slide, they, they are gonna develop eventually, they are gonna grow. And what's gonna happen when, they, when, they, when the developing countries, these African countries actually grow in size? This is a, a very nice picture that I actually found on the social media. Like my friend was posting this, how big is Africa? And as you can see, a lot of the regions actually go into this continent, showing that this continent is massive. And not only in terms of size, but it's, it has abundance of resources, fossil fuels, like various natural gases, diamond. So it's a very big, uh, very big, continent and it has a potential to grow and if you just ignore them because they are like still developing then it's going to cause problem in the in the future i mean we might able to reach net zero with the developed countries reducing their co2 emissions but what if these countries also follow the traditional pathway then what i think is that we're going to go back to ground zero we're going to start again and say oh we have to reduce uh, co2 emissions so Africa is no small continent and it has a, a large potential. And as you can see, the population, again, I, I drew it in a black line here. As you can see, the population of Africa, African countries are growing rapidly and it's gonna grow much more. So as you know, population means they, they, you know, the more mouths to feed and the economy has to grow and well, once again, more people means more like using up the resources, electricity, and what that eventually leads to higher CO2 emissions. So, and also, as you can see here, the urban population, 
uh, has been growing as well. Why is it growing? Because people are moving towards the urban centers to have a better, like to increase their uh, living standards, to enjoy the, I guess, the, the, what the urban centers are giving. For example, Korea also has a similar issue where like Seoul is the capital and a lot of people are like just pouring into the, the, the capital and the, the, the greater area around Seoul. So the urban population increasing like this is not really a good sign, but uh, that's a talk for another time. But what I wanna show here right now is that not only the population is growing, but also the urban population is growing and the urban population is likely to have a lot of electricity consumptions going on and just simple equation like more electricity consumption leads to more CO2 emissions if you use fossil fuels for generation and as you can see here Africa's current energy mix is like this and it hasn't changed in the past 30 years because they didn't really have any other options I would say and also they have as I mentioned previously they have a very abundant uh, uh, resources and they have a lot, of, a lot of oil reserves, natural gas, coal also, they have abundance of them. So for them, it's very logical to use up these resources. Why, why would they not use it? I mean, it's, it's available. So they're gonna be using them and it's likely that this energy mix is not gonna change unless we do something. I mean, African countries are trying their best to come up with these renewable uh, uh, renewable energy uh, plans and trying to move away from the fossil fuel, but it's not as easy as, uh, as, as you say. So I'll show you in the next, uh, in the upcoming slides, but so even though they try to pull up the renewable, the share of the renewable uh, energy, it's not gonna happen uh, in the near future from what, what I see. So the energy mix is likely to remain like this. And not only the energy mix is gonna remain, but it's consumption is gonna rise. So I'm sure you get the point I'm trying to uh, drive here that eventually if you leave them alone, if they leave their, their uh, if you leave Africa as it is and let them take on the traditional pathway, traditional development pathway, then CO2 is going to grow, uh, it's going to rise, and we will have to, again, do the same, go through the same process of trying to mitigate the CO2 emissions. Again, uh, a lot of uh, fossil fuel projects that's going on around Africa, Egypt, South Sudan, Uganda. I mean, not only did they use these for themselves, but these are actually exported. So uh, fossil fuel is actually a very a big part of the, the African country's economy. So it's not only for them to consume, but it's for them to survive. It's for them to export these fossil fuels out to uh, developed countries. In fact, because of the COVID-19 uh, situation, their um, GDP has actually declined greatly because they couldn't trade or they could not export these uh, fossil fuels out. Here, as I said, uh, the fossil fuel revenue for them, uh, it's massive. A lot of countries have um, for, like rely heavily on fossil fuel. Nigeria, for example, oil, is, it's, it's massive for their revenue. Um, but there are some countries that do not rely on, on fossil fuel, for example, Botswana, and which is one of the reasons I chose Botswana because it's their energy mix is quite... Uh, quite simple, so it's easy to see a transition. I mean, I am gonna show you later how I did the scenario analysis, but Botswana relies mostly on coal, so it's quite easy for them to make a transition if they, if they plan to. Uh, but other African countries, it's not as easy as we, we see. Um, they're relying heavily on fossil fuel and it's, it's part of their livelihood, so. Um, Please bear it in mind. Now, uh, Botswana is the, the case study that I was I, I did. And to give you a bit of background, um, the capital is Gabon. As you can see, the population is quite small. The, the land size is quite big, which is about 5.8 times of South Korea, but their, their population is only about two, 
2.3 million. So it's very uh, small country in terms of population. But uh, as you can see, they rely heavily on like resources, uh, like diamonds. Uh, from my memory, they're one of the, uh, they're one of the biggest, actually the biggest diamond uh, exporters. They have a big mine, uh, diamond mine. So they rely heavily on mining and also in farming, like uh, meat expo uh, exports. So as you can see, uh, this country relies heavily on mining and mining also eats up a lot of electricity and a lot of fossil fuel. So now the research question that I wanted to bring up in this article was three things. Like first is an energy security. I mean, um, Botswana is, is relying heavily on South Africa because South Africa used to have, uh, they have a nuclear power uh, generator. So they have a lot of electricity and they used to export it to neighboring countries. But eventually they reduced their uh, export because they couldn't handle the demand, like, like the local demand. So they reduced the, the, uh, the export and that had an impact on Botswana's energy security. So the first, the first thing I wanted to look into is how can they secure the energy security, which is to diversify the energy mix, not rely heavily on exports, uh, imports and coal. And second is adequate and stable supply of electricity. Um, peak demand control, as I said, like when I was living there, there are frequently like power shortages and they had to like turn off the, the electricity. I, I had to live without like two, three hours without electricity from time to time. And also like 47% of the population has no access to electricity. And third is, as, as, as I mentioned, the CO2 emissions. Uh, which they have, like it's NDC now, but they submitted it to reduce it to 15% by 2030. So the aim was for them as a uh, aim was to secure these three points. How can Botswana uh, plan their energy mix that they can actually secure their energy security and have an adequate and stable supply of electricity and also at the same time reduce CO2 emissions? Uh, these are some of the energy policies that Botswana had have, and as you can see, they have been trying to promote uh, uh, renewable energy. It's not that they have been have been re relying solely on fossil fuel. Not only Botswana, a lot of uh, a lot of African countries also have plans for renewable energy to increase the share of renewable energy in their energy uh, energy mix. But it's not as easy as uh, you know said than done. But so they tried various methods. They tried to uh, increase the PV market, uh, the um, solar energy, or tried to use off-grid method. And they even had a biomass energy strategy, which sort of didn't really work out. But um, they they had plans. They had plans for it. So. The electricity supply, as I mentioned before, um, this is a bit dated back, but still the, the import and gener the internal generation ratio is not, hasn't really changed much uh, from back then. And this is the map. As you can see, uh, Botswana relies heavily on this South African generation and their exports, uh, but their exports, has been reduced because South Africa cannot keep up with the internal demand. So they have been reducing it for, uh, and the cost has been rising. So Botswana had to actually find, find a way to like secure the energy security by increasing their internal generation. But at the same time, they had to reduce their CO2 emission. So what I tried to, what I did was first, I uh, used the econometric uh, estimation of the electric demand then uh, did a dynamic forecasting based on the estimation until 2030, then used a scenario and cost analysis and produced results and policy implications for the Botswana government based on my results. Um, the, 
the model that I use is called LEAP. It's Long Range Energy Alternative Planning System. Energy modelers would have heard, uh, it's a very easy tool to use, but uh, I'm sure not, not everyone knows this. So if I just briefly go through it, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very useful, easy, but very useful and powerful tool uh, for modeling your um, modeling the energy mix and uh, not only exploring but also forecasting what is how is it going to be in the future and also it uses a linear optimization so it matches the demand and supply based on what uh, what parameters you give usually it, it's done by cost and so they calculate um, what is the the fixed cost what is the the operating cost all these costs are um, calculated and try to match the demand with the lowest cost possible. And cost analysis, it's not, um, uh, cost analysis is how much each energy is gonna be costing. If you're gonna be, uh, eventually it's gonna give you an energy mix and you can see how much the total of this uh, energy mix is gonna um, cost. So one thing I did uh, was that LEAP model itself has internally, it has a forecasting um, method or tool within it, it's built inside. So by using the demo, demographic di uh, data and various macroeconomic data, you can actually forecast it within LEAP. But the, the I guess the, the shortfall is that you can only calculate it from a base space year. So you cannot really see the historical data. So what I did was I used the econometric method to pull in the past data. So historical uh, energy demand to increase the, the forecasting reliability, uh, the reliability of the forecast results. So that's why I say external input, meaning that I actually calculated the, the of demand, then input it into the lead model, which actually increased the, the reliability of my uh, results. And as you can see, the model can do various things, not only demand analysis, but you can also change different, you can input different, uh, I guess, energy technologies if you want, and also calculate the resources, whether you have to export or import these resources. And then these, based on how much you have used up, you can calculate the environmental externalities. Usually we uh, look into CO2 emissions and based on all these data, it can give you a cost benefit analysis as a final result. It's a very useful tool. If you're interested in energy modeling, I'll, I'll suggest you start with this model, which is very easy to understand and very easy to use. Uh, this is just an equation that I use to forecast. Uh, so I'll just pass. So, this is the forecast, forecast result. As, you, as I mentioned um, here, here, the dotted lines are the blue and yellow dotted lines are the historical, historical demand, uh, like the import and generation. And the, the, uh, what is the, the black line, black line is the historical demand. As you can see the generation, the import has been dropping rapidly around 2010. So Botswana had to force themselves to increase their generation, but it, it doesn't meet, as you can see, it doesn't meet the demand. So there's a shortfall. And, and that's what I meant by like, how can they secure the energy security? If, if this is happening, if the import is dropping, then eventually we'll have to assume that in, there's gonna be no imports at a certain point. So Botswana has to generate everything by themselves. And what kind of energy mix should they take to meet the red? The red line is the demand, the future demand. What should they do to meet the uh, future energy demand? So I, I put up a very simple scenario. Um, business as usual is based on the Botswana's national plan. Whatever they said, um, they said they're going to be putting up some, uh, um, what is it, solar PV. They're going to use uh, concentrated solar panels uh, and biomass. So business as usual is they, use, they are using uh, all the energy mix they have and coal, which is mostly um, what they depend on. But 
what happens if what happens if the investment cost of other renewable technologies are reduced? So this is the scenario that I put up. So P3 to P7 is very straightforward. It means it being reduced by 30% up to 70%. This was based on the, on the I think, uh, um, the international organizations, they came up with various forecasts that the, the renewable energy technologies are likely to drop in between the range of 30 to 70 percent. So I used that to come up with the scenario and said what would happen to Botswana's uh, energy mix if they if the investment cost actually drops by 30 to 30 to 70 percent. So this is the, the result that Reed gave me and as you can see in B, uh, BAU scenario, uh, there isn't much change that, uh, as you can see, mostly it's coal, and at the bottom you can see the solar, the, the grid, like grid uh, pattern is, is solar. Because Botswana National Plan by themselves, they, uh, they actually mentioned that they're going to be putting up about, I think it was 100 meg megawatts or so of um, solar energy. So that's why when you go to BAU, this is going to be, uh, this is just, uh, this is how the national plan is. But when actually, when the price uh, of the renewable technologies drop by 70%, as you can see, eventually the cost of, um, cost of solar energy increases, uh, uh, sorry, the cost of solar energy decreases, meaning that it becomes cost, uh, cost competitive compared to coal. And it can actually replace coal to a certain extent by 2030. So 70% drop is an extreme, I would say an extreme case or the, the extreme end, but it, can, it shows that it can actually replace a lot of the um, coal dependent uh, energy mix. So the result shows that as um, CO2 emission, as you can see, uh, obviously, because the more solar is coming in, the CO2 emission is going to be uh, dropping. And P7 is, P7 scenario has the lowest uh, mitigation of CO2 emissions. And any, in terms of annual uh, investment, um, this shows that when does it break? So when does, when does the solar uh, PV start replacing coal and depending on the price uh, it will start uh, for when the price of the the renewable technologies drop up to 50 percent uh, it's not cost competitive within that short time frame so it doesn't there isn't much replacement of coal but when it drops by 60 and 70 percent they eventually start replacing it uh, by 2026 and if it drops by 70%, it, it, drop, uh, it starts replacing as early as 2022. The more interesting result that I want to share is that coal actually remains, I actually calculated the levelized cost of electricity and uh, the coal remains as the cheapest resource for electricity generation. So for Botswana, uh, even though renewable technology drops by 70%, uh, the price drops by 70%, coal still remains this, um, this, uh, the, the cheapest source of electricity generation, which is about 0 0.114 per kilowatt hour. And, but for P7, it comes all like, um, I guess it comes quite close if it drops by uh, P7, but unfortunately that's, it doesn't really reach the grid, grid, parity, uh, grid parity by 2030. Um, see that. As you can see, I calculated the LCOE and the time frame is too short. It's not enough for them to, uh, for their cost, uh, cost of electricity to meet by 2030, which is, uh, means that the price has to come down extremely low for them to even, start replacing coal or the government decides to like subsidize the the, the solar uh, solar PV for them to for the market to actually start implementing it 
And the reason I, I uh, the reason is that the electricity market is too small, and uh, if you let future electricity consumption is gradual. And actually, the government plans to construct more coal power plants. So all these things uh, coming together actually reduces the price of coal, and it remains the the cost competitiveness competitiveness of coal. So unless the the government decides to sort of like put more weights on on solar PV, it's likely that coal will remain as the dominant uh, energy source in Botswana. But even though it's even though the 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 coal remains with a high uh, cost competitiveness. I, I suggested that even though they, there is a chance for them to increase the, the solar PV, so the future of cost uh, is likely to drop. And if the, as I mentioned, if the government decides to subsidize it and meet that gap between the between coal and solar PV. It is still competitive in the market. So the government, it's really on depending on the government's will, like the political will to promote the solar PV and try to introduce it as early as possible. And um, that was the policy implication that I could give to the Botswana government. As you can see, renewable projects in Africa is they are working on, they are working on it, but the Southern Africa, as you can see, has the highest uh, highest um, power generation of in terms of renewable projects, but that's mostly in South Africa. South Africa, it's sort of like you have to separate South Africa when, when you want to talk about other parts of Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, because South Africa is really, they have a nuclear uh, power generation and they're really doing well with uh, renewable energy. So they're very leading country. So it'll be unfair to put them into the same categories as other sub-Saharan African countries. But they are working on it. Problem is that it is still very small and the, and they, and the share of a renewable energy in the total energy mix is very, very small. And they really have to work on it if they wanna contribute to the, contribute to the mitigation efforts of CO2 emissions. And as I mentioned, the price has been dropping rapidly. Solar PV is very cheap right now, but uh, cost itself is, I guess it's one factor, but it's not the only factor because installing them and, and maintaining them is another story. And when I was in Botswana, they actually had a pilot project. Like they tested whether uh, solar PV is uh, applicable in Botswana. They actually had a very small uh, power plant. I think it was like one megawatt something. But problem was it was they built it, but it was not maintained. So eventually, it sort of like got forgotten. And later, I heard that people came and stole the parts. And so in Africa, it's not only about like like installation costs, but it's also maintenance and how they're gonna keep it running because. As you know, like renewable energy, it's not about just building it, but maintaining it, it's, it's more difficult. So even though the prices keep reducing, there are a lot of things for them to work on before it actually uh, becomes a major part of the energy mix. Then like we looked at the supply side of the, the African countries, then we'll have to look into the, the, the demand side. And as you can see, still about 42% in, uh, is 42% in, uh, like in Africa is without electricity access. And they're mostly rural, uh, rural people, uh, people living in the rural areas. And as I mentioned before, North Africa, we usually separate it from the Sub-Saharan Africa, because as you can see, North Africa has 98, uh, 98 electrification rate compared to the other parts, other regions of Africa, which has, I guess, average of 40 or so. So as you can see, it's quite different. Like the, the, the situation is quite different from North Africa and other regions of uh, Africa. 
So I had a look uh, in another article. I had a look through the the demand side of uh, demand side of the the, the energy and. and this I had a look into the residential uh, residential energy use in Kenya, and as you can see, there's still a high dependency on biomass, and there's really nothing they can do because they don't have the money, they don't have the resources, and if they want to buy something, they'll have to go out to the urban centers to like even buy kerosene or some diesel for their power gener uh, diesel power generators. So there's a lot of uh, uh, opportunity cost of time to fetch firewood and children are used for household support instead of schooling and the harmful smoke that, they, they, uh, that comes out from them using these uh, biomass actually affects their health and a lot of them dies from this. And there's so many, so many I guess, negative externalities environmental externalities from them using biomass. So I was looking into how can they, what, what are the factors that could affect them to use more modern, modern energy? Not, not electricity, but maybe climb up the energy ladder. And if you look at the rural household fuel choice, this is the fuel choice they have. For lighting, they have solar energy, kerosene, battery, and fuel wood. And some have grid electricity, but mostly they don't. And the grid electricity is usually uh, those areas close to the urban center. Also cooking, they use LPG, kerosene, charcoal, and fuel wood. Even though they have fuel choice of uh, so many fuel choice, majority of them still continue to use fuel wood, uh, uh, fuel wood or kerosene for lighting. So I'm not going to go through the, the whole process, but just give you the policy implication. So I looked at the factors that might be um, affecting their, their cooking fuels and lighting fuels. And as you can see, um, it's to do with their, their household income and whether they have a higher education or, or um, higher energy expenditure. So, so the results shows that they're highly influenced by the household income, wealth, and educational level of the household, and improving the household stove. I'm not sure if you heard about those projects where they're trying to change them to more cleaner, cleaner uh, stove, cooking stove. There are a lot of projects that are going, um, they're doing to improve the situation and trying to. Um, dissuade them from using uh, fuel wood because of the, the negative effects that it has. And households tend to prefer solar gen generation and choose kerosene if not affordable. So this is the, mostly this is the case for rural households without electricity. And giving them, I, I even thought about like, why don't we give them off-grid, but off-grid power generation, but uh, it's not, it's just that it's not affordable for them. Even though you give them off-grid power generation, you can build it, but as I, as I mentioned previously, it's hard to maintain it. And trying to maintain the off-grid power generation for these rural areas, it's, it's, it's too much. Uh, it's cost too much and it's not effective. So it's better for them to climb up the energy ladder step-by-step step until the infrastructure gets, it improves. So this is another article that I tried to look in. Uh, I tried to look into whether financial inclusion can be an effective mitigation measure by, by seeing if uh, does financial inclusion, uh, financial inclusion of these rural households have an impact on the environmental Kuznets curve. And, and what we found out, me and my colleague found out is that it does have a mitigation uh, measure. Uh, it can be used as a mitigation measure, meaning that the higher the financial inclusion, uh, it, the higher it gets, it has, it follows the pattern of environment, environmental Kuznets curve. So when policymakers uh, design their policies, they should consider the synergy effect of financial inclusion in developing, uh, designing development and climate change policies. 
So these are the, the two, um, two policy implications that I had. Policymakers should consider finance inclusion as both development and climate change policy measure, uh, policy measure, meaning that at an early stage, the credit market will develop as, as the focus is improving on the financial access. So at the, at the current stage, at the early stage, the, the rural households do not even have basic uh, financial, uh, financial access. So the first, at the first stage, what they'll do, try to do is to improve the final access and uh, financial access and provide the, provide the basic financial services. And as later stage, when the stock market starts to develop, companies will diversify their financial methods by selling stocks and investments will become more influential. Meaning that the investors are at the later stage would be more attracted to, to companies with more social responsibilities and stricter investment decision-making processes. So for the rural, rural, um, for the rural uh, households, it's not about focusing on the environmental improvement, but it's more like it's to, to help them develop. It's, it should be used, the policies should be used as, a, as an adaptation, uh, adaptation measure to help the vulnerable people prepare against the impacts of climate change. And also uh, financial inclusion is a prerequisite for attracting private investment to low carbon projects. So private, um, private investment is usually leveraged by financial services and it is difficult to obtain private investment without first establishing a finance, financial infrastructure. So um, what I mean by that is that it's as it is, because the rural areas and the, these African countries, they have such weak financial services that they first need to develop the, the financial services, financial, I guess, institutions and infrastructure for them, for these private investments to come in which is again, um, to help, help leverage these uh, low carbon projects and to help them develop the renewable energy um, projects. So government should also support the financial inclusion by setting up regulatory and legal frameworks to ensure a transparent and reliable financial system. So I've shown you the, the overall picture of how Africa is and shows, showed some case studies of certain countries, Botswana, Kenya, and also the effect of financial inclusion on the environment, environmental Kuznets curve. And I wanna come back to the fruitful thought that I said in the beginning, like where, what is the future of Africa? And it is quite difficult to say because um, even though I mentioned all these different uh, different methods or different ways of improving their lives or improving the power sector, it's not that easy. It's it's um, everyone thinks about it. Everyone thinks about different projects that can help, but how are they going to do it? It's just another story, and how are we going to achieve inclu uh, inclusive transition? It's a story that we need to actually discuss and develop uh, ideas on. And some of the barriers that I thought about, like what, are the, what could be the barriers for inclusive transition in Africa? And from my Kenya paper, I, I mentioned education, like educating the people and actually letting them know about the, the uh, issues of climate change and letting them know, showing them that there's a better life or a better way of doing things. For example, changing the cooking stove from fuel, uh, fuel wood co uh, cook stove to more cleaner cook stove, they don't do it because they they don't do it because uh, most of them because they don't even know that it exists. So they just do it as as they've been doing it for their whole life, or they've been doing it traditionally. So education plays a big role in um, helping these people come out of that, uh, come out of their traditional ways to more cleaner path. And also infrastructure, as I as I mentioned, building power generator is another story. I mean, you can build power generators, but in a lot of cases, the infrastructure just cannot support it. And about two thirds of the African infrastructure um, 
is unreliable. So even though you can give them enough supply, you can build enough power generators, but it, it doesn't go to where, it, where it's needed. So building up the infrastructure could be another issue that Africa needs to solve. Financial institution, uh, from my last paper I showed you, financial inclusion uh, is it's necessary to, uh, to fund these projects and to help uh, various levels of people and uh, uh, people living in various levels of uh, uh, living standards and also investment. I guess money is another big issue. It's, it's like you can have plans, but the funding and investment, it's, it's not supporting it. So that like how you bring the money into the country or how you bring the money to these development projects is that could be another issue. And technology. Um, technology is, as we all know, we, they need these advanced technologies to actually leapfrog. So this is the drawing that I drew here is that they can follow the traditional pathway of going, like degrading the environment and like then going over the threshold. But why can't they just leapfrog from one side to the another? And rather than destroying, why, didn't, why can't they just leapfrog to the more cleaner or more environmental friendly ways? And one way could be like technolog technological uh, transfer, but um, it's not as easy as we say. So, I mean, everyone can say that technology should be transferred, but transferring technology to these different countries is not very easy. And there could be a lot more, uh, more barriers to inclusive transition. Like some countries have political instability and like Somalia, for example, they don't, um, they don't even have a, a, a strong government. So that could be an issue. And so they have like a lot of problems that Africa has, a lot of barriers they have that you have to overcome. Uh, in order to actually um, thrive for uh, inclusive transition. So these are just some of the thoughts that I'm having. And at the moment, uh, at, at the, the Stanford Center at the Incheon, Incheon, Global, uh, Incheon Global Campus, we are more looking into uh, various aspects like investment, technology, policy, and trying to find a way how we can uh, achieve the inclusive transition. Okay, thank you very much. That's all for me. Any questions? Thank you, Youngjun. It was it was great. Uh, I think we have five minutes for the Q and A. Uh, we have a question from Austin Park in the chat. So if I can read, uh, so I'm curious why the solar LCOE is so high in Botswana. Well, yeah, a lot of people ask me that question because um, usually, like the LC, I mean the the solar solar uh, PV LCU is quite low in other countries. But uh, this uh, this is a case study that I did for Botswana, and at the moment they have no solar power uh, power um, solar PV installed. So when they start bringing in from like based on the scenario, if they start bringing in and, it, and, and I calculate up to 2030, there's just not enough time for it to like uh, reach grid parity and to reduce its uh, LCOA in time. So it's quite, um, I guess it's quite specific to the country, uh, not, not to, I guess, the global standard. Mm. Yeah, if I can read the rest uh, from Austin, like he was, asking is there any difference coming from the lack of access to the cheap capital um yeah thanks uh, thanks for your answer i was just curious uh i know a large fraction of the development cost for renewable plants comes from the cost of capital you know so so if you have to um get some more expensive capital it can cost a lot more to build a project um but and I, I thought that might be a reasonable barrier for best one i wasn't sure but it, it is still just kind of shocking to me that um that the price of solar would be you know three times close maybe close to four times as much in Botswana. um 
So yes, uh, that, is, that is a problem with the, the country. And actually I had to, when I was calculating the, um, the, the when I was calculating, I had to actually use proxy numbers because Botswana didn't have solar PV, tech, uh, like they didn't have these specifications. So what I did is actually, I brought it from South Africa. So South Africa had uh, numbers for like very uh, various technologies, not, not only solar PV. So in that case, if, if you had to install it in, in Botswana, it's likely that the capital cost will actually increase more than decrease. So the mm -hmm. LCOA might even increase higher than what I, I, what I calculated. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Yeah, maybe um, one more question from the audience. If you have any, um, raise your hand. Uh, if it's not, I actually have a lot of questions, but you know, like we have limited time. So uh, if I, I may, uh, I just want to like ask you one question. I mean, I have a lot of questions about the models and then, you know, like all those, you know, like a technology um, uh, interventions and then how that actually changed the curve more dramatic ways and so, so on. But, you know, we can have a separate uh, uh, conversation later, but, you know, it's really, a simple but very interesting picture that you show like a three scenarios one is you know like uh, the very like a traditional like a development pathways and then the second is you know like the global inequality and then the third is in, um, like inclusive transition um i wonder uh how like a now that you like i learned that you have really deep local context of like african countries you know like if you can share your opinions on, you know, like uh, how those interests of like uh, the countries of like a uh, local African countries and also like a uh, developed countries outside of those uh, African countries, uh, like the, their their interests are conflicting. And if uh, the the global is really looking into the, inclu the inclusive transition, like uh, like what how this aligning those you know conflicting interests is coming along, uh, especially in Botswana or any uh, side of um, Africa. Well, I I said e economy inequality and it might give uh, a sign that like the developed countries do not care about developing countries, but they are actually are funding their, these various renewable projects and they're trying to help them come up and trying to help them build up their uh, uh, the inclusive transition. But the issue is maybe because I, I took the whole continent, but each country has different, uh, speci uh, different situations. And the reason I took Botswana is because it's a very stable country and it is known to have like settled in democracy uh, uh, very nicely, it's 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 a model country without like a lot of without much uh, political instability. It's very uh, politically stable. So even Botswana, but problem is um, I haven't really seen much support coming into Botswana, and usually these companies that come in are focusing on the, uh, the resources like diamond, because I, as I mentioned, Botswana has a diamond mine, which is massive. But uh, I haven't really, I, I have to look into this more, but the only thing I've seen was USAID there. And I haven't, I haven't really seen any, any like projects that are supported or trying to help Botswana develop in a way. So I've seen them like supporting other countries like Kenya or Rwanda or but for Botswana, I don't know, I don't know why, but when I was researching, I haven't really seen that that these uh, maybe Germany or US are trying to support their, their transition in a way. So I guess uh, it's I guess it's difficult to say in a whole continent, but you have to look at like country by country country. 
Interesting. Thank you. I try to be mindful of everyone's time. Uh, so I have to let uh, Dr. Yong Jun Baek go. Uh, but thank you for uh, joining us today, everyone. And also thank you, Yong Jun Baek, uh, for, for you know, sharing this really amazing case studies on uh, Botswana and Kenya and everyone, uh, you know, like in, in African, uh, like your experience in uh, African countries, it was amazing. Uh, so um, if, for further uh, like a conversation, you can find Yong Jun uh, contact information on korea.stanford.edu. So feel free to reach out. Um, yeah, so thanks again uh, for, for joining us today, Dr. Beck. Um, yeah, so we'll let you go now. Thank you very much. Uh, and then for those of you who are interested in uh, SFI seminar series, uh, we are going to have a um, uh, summer fellowship information session on March 10th. So uh, stay tuned on the SFI website. We'll be posting what's gonna come up for the uh, next seminar series. So thanks for joining.